We have two speakers tonight, Richard Cheney of Senior Counsel and Richard Sergi, both of whom appeared in the Gould decision in the Court of Appeal, the leading authority on this provision. There has been an excellent paper that has been prepared and it is downloadable on our website and I commend it to you. It's very detailed and goes through the history leading up to the enactment of Section 5.0 and the relevant English authorities. There is a discussion of significant Australian authorities such as McKenna and, Spark and Sparks and Hobson, as well as practical tips on the matters you'll need to prove a Section 5.0 defence. But not everything in that paper can be covered today. And as a result, our speakers have chosen that part of the subject that might be of most interest to you. Our first speaker is Richard Sergi, one of Greenway's most experienced practitioners in medical negligence and coronial work. He likes Italian coffee, he likes Italian beer, <laughs> and he likes trips to Italy. Richard is going to take you through the facts in Gould and the judgment at first instance, a tome of some 720 paragraphs, his favorite subject. Richard appeared in that matter and he had hair before the judgment came down. <laughs> Our second speaker is Richard Cheney, a senior counsel, who has extensive experience in medical negligence, infrastructure and construction disputes. He has been listed as leading construction and infrastructure senior counsel, as well as leading insurance senior counsel in Doyle's Guide this year. Richard enjoys coffee, Richard enjoys beer, and Richard enjoys holidays to caravan parks or anywhere else he can go. Richard will then take you through the unanimous decision of the Court of Appeal in Gould, as well as provide some practical tips on pleadings and other matters that you can take away from the decision. I hand over to Richard Sergi. Um, first of all, thanks for coming at this time of the year um, to get some points, or a point. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to say that my part of the talk, Richard and, decided, Richard and I decided, would pretty well be restricted to just the uh, facts of Gould so that people might be able to appreciate a little more the context in which Richard's going to speak to you about what we should or shouldn't do now when we're um, dealing with a case um, such as, uh, well, such as Gould or any other medical negligence matters. Um, as I say, that the purpose really is to um, help you to get through, as Ben said, 720 pages of the trial judge's decision, which Richard very diplomatically described in our Court of Appeal submissions as being a difficult read. Um, the judgment, I should say, was somewhat amusing because when we collected the judgment, I was there with two solicitors who commented when the two binders were handed down to us that it was very thoughtful of the judge to give us a copy of the judgment when, in fact, it was actually the one judgment. Um, be that as it may, um, facts. Um, very briefly, the facts in Gould involved, and the plaintiff was a terrific plaintiff. Um, he was a young boy, eight at, eight at the time of injury, 13 at the time of trial. He was um, cute, he was well spoken, articulate, he had everything going for him. So the fact that we persisted with the trial, I think, um, speaks volumes for the decision of those who were instructing me initially. Um, he had a nasty, and he had a fair income injury, he had a very nasty, severe crush injury to his left thumb. He was playing with a mate in or near a stormwater drain. There was no clear evidence about the circumstances, and it became quite an issue at the trial as to the extent to which um, he might have been exposed to contaminated water, which was relevant, really relevant, because it, um, much of the trial, a lot, most of the trial, turned upon what the antibiotic and prophylactic treatment was um, before surgery and then the antibiotic treatment afterwards. But in short, um, you'll see that he had an extensive comminuted acute fracture through the distal proximal phalanx of the left thumb with separation. Doc he was taken to Campbelltown initially, then on to Liverpool where, where he could get tertiary treatment. There was a surgical delay because um, some uh, motor vehicle accident victims had come in and he was bumped to the next day, which became part of the trial um, on allegations of negligence against, against us that we didn't get to him soon enough. But Dr Scott, who was the VMO head of the hand surgery department at Liverpool, um, was the person who ultimately operated on uh, young Mr Gould and he determined that it was a very complex crush fracture injury. 
he in fact said, um, and during his oral evidence, um, that he used KYs and sutures, including suturing the fractures together, because um, they couldn't actually be pinned properly. He said he'd only done it three or four times in his practice, and he regarded the procedure that he was carrying out as something more of a salvage procedure. And in his view, the ability of the digit to survive, that is, the, and it was the left thumb of his non-dominant hand, was in doubt. And if it wasn't even the thumb, or if it was an older patient, he wouldn't have even attempted to carry out the surgery. So the injury was very severe indeed. Um, the young boy was returned to the ward and put on antibiotic therapy. Um, the, the regime was very typical and later on this becomes important. It was flutoxacillin, cafazolin and augmentin duofort um, following his discharge. Um, after he was discharged from uh, the hospital, he saw the hand clinic a few times. And again, it was very important evidence from the hand clinic plastic surgery registrar who was then in private practice when he was called. And he gave some evidence about um, his examination of the thumb. It was dry gangrene and not wet gangrene. And this was a big argument of fact in the trial. The, the relevance being that if it was wet gangrene, it was indicative of a uh, infective process, whereas if it was dry, was more likely a reflection of an ischemic injury in which, which had just caused the thumb to die. Um, X-rays were undertaken initially that showed no osteomyelitis, so that became a bit of an issue as well later on. But in any event, ultimately, um, Lad had his, had his thumb amputated in September 2011, so about a month afterwards. Now, the statement of claim was described by Justice Leeming as a sparse document. Um, it made no uh, reference, for example, to the Civil Liability Act at all, um, and that's a mistake. <laughs> for those of you who have a plaintiff's practice, you should probably refer to the Act. Um, and from the defendant's point of view, it requires you to make a few guesses as to what the plaintiff's case is, which is always a problem and makes preparation a bit difficult. But the ess essence of the plaintiff's case was that there was no appropriate and timely antibiotic therapy and no appropriate and timely wound debridement. The latter of those two things um, was a source of some aggravation at trial but gradually fell away um, during the trial. Um, there was no issue in the case that the defendant owed a duty, but breach was denied, causation was denied and Section 50 was pleaded. Um, and Justice Leeming, in his very careful, usual way, noticed that because there was no reply from the plaintiff, therefore there was a, an implied joinder of the issues on the defence. Okay, expert evidence. There was mercifully only four experts. Um, Associate Professor Raftos, emergency physician. Dr Mansour, a paediatrician for the plaintiff. And then for the defendant, Associate Professor Gatiss, the uh, microbiologist, and Dr Peter Harch, the uh, hand surgeon slash plastic surgeon. Now, Dr Gatiss was uh, retained because he was an expert in microbiology. Dr. Harge because he was a hand surgeon, Dr. Raftos because he was an expert emergency physician, and Dr. Mansour, we didn't really know why he was retained or gave an, uh, gave an, uh, an opinion, given that he was a paediatrician, although it didn't stop him expressing various views. Um, in the end, only um, Professor Raftos and Professor Gatiss participated in um, a conclave and gave joint evidence. The basis of their um, opinions were as follows. Professor Raftos said you had to give gentamicin. Dr Mansell will forget about him. Associate Professor Gators said really what was required was to follow the therapeutic guidelines antibiotic and that's what in fact was done and that, that's a, a theme that we should bear in mind when we're going through the judgment later on uh, when Richard gets to it. Dr Harch said the antibiotic regime was appropriate and the surgical delay was, delay was not inappropriate and that was part of the earlier um, aspect of the plaintiff's case. Now, Dr Scott, the treating surgeon, gave very important evidence about the antibiotic procedure. And i just stop here and interrupt myself by saying that um, much of what the plaintiff was able, uh, the defendant was able to rely on in making its submissions was the subject of evidence given by Dr Scott, the treating surgeon, and also uh, Dr Sivan uh, Atham, um, who was the plastic surgery registrar who saw him. And 
in my experience, and this is a good example of it, it really is necessary to call the people involved because you can only get so far without them. And it doesn't matter whether you're the defendant or, or you're the plaintiff. You really need to have them um, give the evidence in court orally rather than to rely on even a statement. Um, but it's very important. I'll just move over. Now, this is an interesting thing. Um, and it became the subject of some discussion in the Court of Appeal matter, and Richard might take you to this, but His Honour was very concerned that um, when we were going to call Dr Scott, um, we were going to give some opinion evidence. And of course, as Justice Leeming noted in the Court of Appeal decision, um, were we to do that, we would have had to comply with the rules. But I was very keen to get um, from Dr Scott what he'd actually done, because of course his practice was what was going to mean that we were able to defend the matter or not. So his Honour tried to box us into a corner there. Um, you'll see there's one aspect of Dr Scott's opinion I need to be forward about. Will you be seeking to elicit from him evidence as to peer professional opinion in Australia? No. And he tried again, no. So we had to be pretty firm about what we were going to do. And I've just put there a little note from Justice Leeming in his decision at appeal where he, he makes the point that the question of what in fact is a standard practice of professional peers throughout Australia is at least in part a question of fact. It may be that in some cases the distinction of opinion and fact is difficult to draw, but Dr Scott's evidence did not fall into this category. So you really need to adduce some evidence of um, what was done, and as far as you can, the more, the more likely it is to be a question of fact, the safer you'll be in having it survive um, later on, uh, both at trial and should it go anywhere else. So it's very important. Okay, now this is an interesting part because um, this is where we get to the evidence about the, the practice. And fortunately, this is quite a good example and a simple example of what is going to suffice for a practice and to establish a practice consistent with um, peer professional standards. Now I've asked him there, what sort of IV did you give the boy? And he said, that's standard in my coverage for any traumatic wound in the hand, apart from essentially dog bites. So at the, at the moment we've got Dr. Scott's standard, standard treatment. And then dog bites, different antibiotics, but most other simple lacerations and traumatic wounds, cofazolin is our standard treatment. August 01, so we've tied it back to the relevant spot. Yes, now this is the sort of interesting bit. He's on a... Uh, in his inimitable way, um, like to, uh, to sort of tidy up little things along the way and interpose himself. And he says, when you say standard treatment, do you mean at that hospital? And fortunately, I, I knew what Dr. Scott was going to say. And he said, at every hospital I've worked at, apart from one in New Zealand, they had a different antibiotic that, that they were able to give. And then his honour is sort of giving people the benefit of his expertise here. Do they follow the Westmead protocols? No, they would follow the therapeutic guidelines antibiotics which is, of course, consistent with um, what Professor Gatiss' expert opinion was, which I assume Westmead would cover, but different hospitals might have different guidelines. And, of course, his honour thought, well, I better leave this now. It's not really going anywhere. <laughs> so it gave me the opportunity to sort of ask the doctor some questions that I... Dorothy Dixon's, really. Every hospital you've worked at, he's worked at Liverpool, presently at Fairfield. Mm hmm. Do you relate to just those two hospitals? No. And then, of course, he mentioned... Um, all the other big hospitals in Sydney. So that, that was a very pleasing part of the trial from my point of view um, because we'd got from him the fact that in his experience, and he was a VMO head of department, all these other places adopted the same process and that process was consistent with the, the uh, therapeutic guidelines, antibiotics. So that's, that's the practice that became the subject of the appeal decision above. Um, causation, there was some issue about wet gangrene and dry gangrene and that was um, again related to the antibiotic issue um, and, and as you can see there well, I've, I've reminded us all that it's a question of infection versus necrosis and the theory from our point of view was that it wasn't an infective process, um, it was necrosis and that goes back to Dr Safasethan's examination where he said it was dry gangrene that is necrotic and not wet gangrene being an infection. And I've set out there um, another comment from Justice Leeming. Um, one of the things that the trial judge did was uh, 
asked, for example, in relation to, um, well, a number of things, but um, what happened in this case was that Dr. Sathasivam said, look, I've, this is, these are my notes, this is what they mean, it means dry gangrene. There were other notes in the clinical records which suggested it may have been something else. There was some from some nursing staff and nothing was ever put to Dr. Sathasivam that, in fact, his notes were wrong or it was really wet gangrene. Nothing was done about that at all. And the trial judge invited um, the plaintiff a couple of occasions, um, well, invited both of us to come back and make supplementary submissions. In fact, seven lots of supplementary submissions, written submissions, after the trial. And on neither of the two occasions when the plaintiff was invited did they make any submissions about something that they hadn't put to Dr. Sathasivam, that is that um, it was wet gangrene, not dry gangrene. And there, um, Justice Leeming just makes the point, there are limitations to the extent to which a primary judge can make findings inconsistent with the plaintiff's choice. And the plaintiff's choice was, well, look, you know, we're not going to go the wet, wet gangrene path. In fact, they relied on a report from Dr. Mansour, and Dr. Mansour was sort of heroically claiming that it was dry gangrene. And, and uh, Ju Judge Levy tried to fix that up. He couldn't fix it up, and the Court of Appeal said, look, there's a limit to what judges can do to try and fix things up. Um, so five, 502, which is really the um, unreasonable aspect, and Richard will have something to say about that. But in essence, um, the Court of Appeal was quite firm about not only did the judge misapply the test, but it was procedurally unfair. And uh, they were, Justice Leamy in particular, was um, quite keen on the idea that it wasn't just procedurally unfair to the defendant, but it was procedurally unfair to the experts themselves to suggest that um, their opinions were irrational without it being put to them. So corporations, this is just another thing that people might care to contemplate um, that has been raised, at least by Judge Levy, I don't know whether anyone else has, but in the event that you do come across it, um, it's something that he, he raises from time to time. Uh, indeed, in another case at the bottom there that I had the misfortune of being in before him as well. And um, I shouldn't say that, it was just difficult. <laughs> Um, where he, he's got this idea that Section 5.0 might only apply to um, people personally and not to corporations. I provided the court with some supplementary submissions on that, which I'm happy to provide to anyone else if you need them, because there's, not, there's nothing on it, and you have to resort to um, second reading speeches and other things. But suffice it to say that every other decision that's been considered by the Court of Appeal has been considered on the basis that 5.0 one applies to corporations as well as to, to individuals. So to the extent that it doesn't say anything about a corporation, um, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Damages, it was just a side issue. Um, of the uh, sort of, how many pages was it? 720 paragraphs, it was about uh, 300 pages almost. Four pages related to damages. Um, and very little of the transcript related to damages. We're going for time, Ben. Pretty good. <laughs> um, one of the reasons that um, made making the appeal attractive was because the trial judge awarded this very attractive plaintiff, from a litigation point of view, not a lot of money. Um, the um, Non-economic loss, he assessed at just 28% of a most extreme case. Uh, future treatment at just $7,500. Passed out of pockets at $430.10. Um, he gave him the boy a, a reasonably small buffer of $150,000. And the amputation meant that the boy had essentially no opposable digit on his left hand. So from our point of view, um, uh, we took the decision that you weren't, we weren't going to appeal uh, quantum at all, which the Court of Appeal really doesn't find that attractive, and just concentrated on the Section 5.0 aspect of it. There's a couple of little other matters um, that I'd like to draw to your attention. First of all, we had to make an application to the Court under the slip rule to correct um, one aspect of the judgment towards the end of it wherein there was a misstatement of really what our submission was on one particular aspect of it. And the reason I, I draw it to your attention is simply because um, it's often when we get a result, 
um, you're so excited by it, you don't really read it that closely. But it may become important because, as it turned out, um, I, the decision, I think, is going to be reported. Um, so it is important that it actually um, reflect properly what what the submissions were through the trial in it um, and the Court of Appeal. Um, and in fact, the slip, the application of the slip rule was made after some corrections had already been made by the Court of Appeal. Um, the other thing is costs. Um, this is just a, an extra little bit as well. Um, there was an application made uh, by my instructing solicitors to have a gross, specific gross sum amount awarded so that the expense of going through the assessment could be avoided. Um, and the application was actually lost, um, essentially because there wasn't evidence of those five things referred to there. It was dealt with on the papers in chambers by Justice Leeming, but if in the event you ever wish to make um, a specific gross sum application, just make sure you address those things. They're not onerous, they're just kind of tiresome, really. Um, lastly, other observations. Um, one thing that I've already mentioned, but which I'd like to mention again, because I think it's really important, is the need to call clinicians, whether they be doctors, nurses, or anyone else, because um, their evidence is just so much more powerful rather than just submissions given to someone and having to stand there um, asking a question, you know, assume this doctor, assume that, assume something else. If the evidence is actually given it's, it's, uh, and it's not controverted, um, it's very powerful. And we, as I said before, are able to rely on that at trial and in the Court of Appeal because we'd called the um, surgeon who gave some terrific evidence. I mean, they always say things that you hadn't heard them say before, like the fact that he'd only tried this surgery a couple of times because it was so hairy. Um, and then Dr. Sathasivam, who came along and was able to give some interpretation to his notes, which, as we all know, aren't always um, completely comprehensive just on their face. And he was able to leave in everyone's mind, at least on the transcript, no doubt about the fact that, in his view, those notes meant there was dry gangrene, not wet gangrene. We attempted resolution. Um, bearing in mind that we knew what our case was and we knew how we were going to get there. But in the end, because the parties couldn't agree on the quantum, we were really forced into, into running it. And that happens from time to time. But to do all of that, to get to that stage, you've got to have the courage of your convictions. And uh, I was very fortunate to have the benefit of solicitors who really wanted to run it and a client, um, a med uh, medical director who really wanted to run it. And um, sometimes you get to the stage where you say, well, if we don't run this one, what ones do we run? So I'm talking this uh, as from a defendant's point of view, but um, the same goes for a plaintiff as well. You've really got to, um, I think, not take any shortcuts as the plaintiff did, I think in this case, perhaps to their detriment by not putting certain things to certain people. For example, um, we had uh, tendered in evidence a statement from the registrar in the ED at Liverpool who saw the plaintiff initially and contacted Dr Scott, his supervisor, who debrided the boy. And it was, it was a great statement, but of course it was open to challenge uh, and cross-examination and the plaintiff simply said, oh, we don't require it, and it went in. Um, and the plaintiff really should have had a crack at that guy. They should have had a go at Dr Sather Sievem and just sort of kept going, kept going, which is the conviction part of it. Um, the trial judge was pretty motivated um, and he did ask us to come back five times and there were seven lots of supplementary submissions on a whole range of topics um, as arguments ebbed and flowed. Um, so you just have to keep persisting. And I've got the wind up, and that's a very convenient time. I notice the time as they say. I think I'll just. There we go. Mr. Cheney's on. Thanks. Um, th that first slide is just a, a reminder that um, there is an updated version of the paper that I did late, late last year after the Sparks and Hobson decision and before. 
the Gould decision was handed down. So that's been updated now to pick up what transpired in Gould. So it's, um, I think, on our website and can be downloaded or uploaded, whatever the term is. Um, I was planning to focus on two things tonight, just f five things that I think should be taken away from the from the decision in Gould and um, then finish perhaps with a couple of tips about pleading and um, proving the section. Uh, so the first of the five points is, and perhaps the most ex important of them, I think, is that um, Gould confirms, if it, if it needed confirming, um, what had previously been said in Dobler and in Sparks about the fact that if Section 5.0 evidence about competent professional practice is adduced and accepted by the judge, then that evidence sets the standard of care and there's no longer a need for an inquiry under Section 5.b and 5.c of the Civil Liability Act. So a lot of it's a, it's a difficult concept to grasp, and a lot of practitioners and judges um, prior to um, the decision in Dabler um, were not grasping it, and and, and in Dabler, um, perhaps to make the point, it's necessary to go back a step to the pre-section 50 days. If you can um, bear with me, um, I'll just run through the other five points. But the the, the other the, the other four points are these: that um, a party alleging irrationality must raise it clearly, which is a point that Surges mentioned earlier. The third is that you can adduce evidence um, from the professional, him or herself, uh, on the 5.0 point. And the, the fourth takeaway is that uh, the, the Gould decision makes it pretty clear that uh, it'll be an extremely rare case where peer professional opinion can be rejected as irrational. Um, and the fifth point is that the mere fact that an opinion is uh, not accompanied by reasons um, is not sufficient to render it irrational, and I'll come to why that is, but um, there may be all sorts of reasons why an unreasoned opinion might be objectionable and be, stru and be struck out of the evidence, but um, the lack of reasons won't render it irrational. We'll come back to that. But just on this first point, and perhaps the most important point, and reminding ourselves what the section, how the section reads, particularly subsection one, a person practicing profession does not incur a liability negligence if it's established that the professional acted in a manner that at the time the service was provided was widely accepted in Australia by peer professional opinion as competent professional practice. And we'll come to the uh, irrationality exception in subsection 2 later. But prior to that section being enacted, um, the uh, High Court in Rogers and Whitaker had uh, emphasised the, the difference between Australian and English law by saying um, that the standard of care was not to be determined solely or even primarily by reference to what the practitioners in the field had to say was the standard or was the practice that was followed, but rather was a matter for the judges to decide. It's for the courts to adjudicate on what is the appropriate standard of care. And 5.0 was, um, this is covered in the paper, all the, the, the history leading up to the enactment of 5.0, but the, one of the purposes of 5.0 was to was to change the position that had been established under Rogers and Whitaker, such that if defendants adduced evidence of what peer professional opinion regarded as competent professional practice, then that should establish the standard rather than judges doing so. Um, and so Dobler was the first of the decisions to, to make the point that if, um, if the if section, or, the, or effectively that Section 5.0 has the effect that if the defendant's conduct, conduct accorded with professional practice regarded as acceptable by uh, some, by, as, by, by some of peer professional opinion, then it's that, that um, subject to rationality, that professional practice sets the standard of care. And it, it was not really until um, uh, the decision in Sparks and Hobson that the court revisited um, what, what Dobler uh, meant, and Justice Baston, who agreed in the decision in Dobler, nevertheless thought that the, that passage I just took you to needed some clarification. Uh, and but but he did so in a way that reiterated the point that if you have Section Five O evidence that is accepted, then that sets the standard. Um, and so in in Dobler, uh, sorry, in Sparks and Hobson, um, Baston. Justice Baston clarified what had been said in Dobler um, and made the point that the proper course in a case where Section 5.0 has been pleaded and has been the subject of evidence is to determine first the standard of care to be applied before assessing the alleged negligence against that standard, um, which would 
with respect, seem to be logical. If there's a 5 defence raised and Section 5 evidence is adduced, then the first question for the trial judge is, well, am I satisfied that that sets the standard? Am I, am I accepting that the defendant's position that this evidence um, enjoys uh, wide acceptance in Australia and, and that, it's, uh, that there's a that peer professional opinion supports it? If the, if the court accepts that position, then that's, that evidence sets the standard. And then one goes to, 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 the, to measuring the defendant's conduct in the particular case against that standard. Um, and then, and importantly, I think in, in Sparks, Justice Baston also emphasised that once you've got to the, the Section 5 evidence, that, that um, the exercise required under Section 5B is, becomes otios in professional negligence cases. You don't embark on a 5B inquiry if, if, um, if you have acceptable Section 5O evidence. And I say all that only by way of introduction to what was then said uh, by um, Justice Leeming in, in Gould, which was to re reiterate the correctness of that approach. Um, and so if there was any doubt before Gould about this proposition, we now have Dobler and Sparks and Hobson and the Gould decision emphasising this point. And Justice Leeming put it this way, the defendant bears the onus of establishing those preconditions, and namely the, the, no, the preconditions are these, and that, that are that that the defendant was practising a profession and was doing so in a manner that was widely accepted by peer professional opinion as competent professional practice. So you've got those two preconditions, and if they're established, then according to Justice Leeming, uh, Sections 5B and 5C only apply if they're not established. If they are established, then the standard of care against which the defendant's conduct is assessed is that which was widely accepted by peer professional opinion, etc. So that's the first takeaway, I think, from the Gould decision. Um, and by the way, in in, in Gould, Leeming, Justice Leeming observed that um, that this that the, the Gould decision, what the Gould case was one such case. That is where the defendant had established um, the preconditions to Section Five O. Indeed, <laughs> in Gould, um, one of the curious aspects of the evidence was that the plaintiff did not, at any point, attack, challenge the those parts of the defendant's expert's evidence to the effect that this does uh, reflect peer professional opinion and, and is widely held. There was no challenge either in their own evidence to that proposition or to, uh, to, to the, uh, n nor was there any cross-examination of the defendants ev experts about that topic. Indeed, the closest I think it got was that Dr. Raftos, in the plaintiff's case, said something to the effect that in, in the same position, he, in his practice, would administer gentamicin to this boy because the whole case turned on whether gentamicin should have been um, part of the antibiotic re regime that was administered. And the defendants' experts were all of one voice that not only would they not uh, ever administer gentamicin to a boy in that situation, but um, all of the therapeutic guidelines were... were there, there were good reasons not to do so, that there were, a grave, there were some grave risks attaching to administering gentamicin to a, a boy in that situation. So. Um, the second point I raised was that um, you, it must, and it's clear enough that if a party wishes to raise irrationality, they've got to raise it clearly. Um, one of the features of um, the Gould decision was that the whole issue about whether the peer professional opinion was irrational wasn't was not ventilated at all at the trial. It wasn't pleaded by the plaintiff. It wasn't ra raised in evidence. It wasn't raised in submissions. Um, and as and we had an exchange with. Justice Leeming in the Court of Appeal, where he asked me what, it, how, how the issue even came up, and I had to answer. Well, it just seems to have been um, the industriousness of his honour in chambers when, <laughs> when writing the judgment, because nobody had any clue that this was going to be raised. And um, just a reminder of what the, what the how the proviso reads: that is, that you can't rely on peer professional opinion if the court considers that the opinion is irrational. But um, and, and I think Serge has made the point that um, Justice Leeming observed that it was procedurally unfair not only to the defendant uh, not to have taken this point up with, with them, in, 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 with, the, with the defendant in pleadings, but it was also unfair to the experts themselves to, to later describe their um, solemnly given evidence about what was pure professional opinion, to, to later describe that opinion as um, 
irrational was unfair in circumstances where that quite serious allegation had not been put to the experts. Um, and this is all extracted in the paper, but that's an extract of the passage in which um, Justice Leeming made the point about how unfair it was to Dr Harsh and, in, and also to Associate Professor Gatiss to accuse them of irrationality when, without putting it to them. Um, and His Honour Justice Leeming made it plain, it seems to me it must be raised by way of reply, if a defendant pleads Section 50 in its defence, if the plaintiff wants to put in issue the rationality of the opinion, it must must be a matter for pleaded reply by the by the plaintiff. And happily enough, Justice Leeming um, made the same point in Gould. Um, the third point can be dealt with quickly, and because, because Serge has already covered it, I think. But this this idea that um, you should try to adduce evidence if you're for a defendant alleging, relying on a Section 5 out defence. You should try to do what you can to, to, to call evidence from the f witnesses of fact, the treaters, as to what is their own experience of the practice. Because as Justice Leeming said, it's, it may be a mixed question of fact and law, uh, but, or fact and opinion, but in the, in the main evidence about what is the practice, a, a witness's evidence about what they've observed to be the practice in other places, such as the evidence of Dr Scott in this case, about what he'd seen done in eight other hospitals, um, that must be uh, evidence going to a matter of fact. And um, and Justice Leeming in, in Gould made the point that it was wrong of Justice of, of Judge Levy to treat the evidence of Dr. Scott as uh, opinion evidence. Um, and there was a. Justice Leeming made a, a reference to a passage in Sparks about about this, that about the fact that um, qu the, the question of what is the standard of uh, the practice or what is standard practice among peer prof pro professional peers is at least in part a question of fact. And there's a reference to that same issue in Sparks. Um, and I think I think Richard um, took you to this passage earlier, but. Um, it's the point that Dr Scott's evidence did not fall into it. the category of part opinion evidence. It was purely factual evidence and should have been received that way. Um, the fourth point, and perhaps um, one that has implications for um, plaintiffs contemplating taking on the irrationality exception, um, is that the real flavour from Gould is that it will be a very rare uh, situation where a court will be able to say of peer professional opinion that, that it's irrational. Um, and ju Justice Leeming identified three flaws in the approach that have been taken by the trial judge in applying the irrationality uh, proviso here. Um, the first was that by reference to that earlier decision of Justice of Judge Levy in um, Hope, um, he, um, he, Judge Levy, uh, adopted the definition of irrational or uh, the, same, the same approach to defining it uh, as he had adopted in uh, Hope. Um, and I must say of that, that um, there's not a lot wrong with what uh, Judge Levy said about irrational in this respect. He, he said that irrational, uh, uh, the term irrational must mean effectively something that's contrary to reason or... or um, uh, and, and doesn't mean something that's not reasoned or without reasons, but something a proposition that runs contrary to reason is more likely to be regarded as irrational than uh, an opinion that's simply expressed unsupported by reasons. Um, but the second flaw was said to be what Judge Levy said in the judgment, that is that the, the term irrational when it's used in the exception is not used in the pejorative sense. and. Um, the, the, the Court of Appeal during the oral argument was <laughs> extremely hostile to that proposition. They, they, the three judges made it clear that they thought that the reference to conduct as irrational or opinion being irrational is ext an extremely pejorative term given the context. The context being you've got these uh, professionals in any given discipline, they're all adhering to a particular practice, they all regard this practice as competent professional practice and by the way they're all irrational. Uh, so the, you know, the, the court was of the view that you couldn't be clearer that 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 term, when it's used in the subsection, should should be regarded as a pejorative one. The third um, third flaw in the reasoning was that 
the Court of Appeal identified in Judge Levy's approach was that his honour, the trial judge, in, in an attempt to put some meat on the bones of what irrational might mean, resorted to dictionary definitions, not of the term irrational or its analogues, but uh, of the term un of unreasonableness. And um, that caused um, Justice Leaving uh, some apoplexy in the, during the oral <laughs> argument because... Um, you know, he made, his honour made the point that if you're going to resort to dictionary definitions, the least you could do is perhaps start with the, the, the very term that you're trying to define. Um, but it, it's actually, uh, the, the Gould decision, which the, 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 um, you, you may have gathered, the principal judgment was delivered by Judge Leeming and um, Justice Leeming and um, uh, Justice Best and, and uh, Just, Justice Ma agreed. But... Um, it's really an interesting and helpful judgment just on um, the proper approach to statutory construction B because he writes so beautifully, <laughs> beautifully and so clearly. It's um, it's well worth a read uh, just on, just on the proper approach to take to construing uh, statutory terms because his honour um, goes for a bit of a walk through the history of the uh, legislation uh, in order to. Um, arrive at this proposition that text, context, and purpose, which are the three things that he looks at, looked at, the text, the context, and the purpose, all support the conclusion that it's a seriously pejorative and exceptionally exceptional thing to find that a professional person has expressed an opinion that's irrational, etc. Um, and so, I, I, I think it's fair to take away this fourth point to take away from Gould that that it'll be a very rare situation where. A, Peer professional opinion is struck down as irrational. Um, and this last point, that an absence of reasoning um, doesn't render something irrational. We, we gave the example, I think, in the oral argument that that, um, that a, an opinion might, exp uh, sorry, an expert might express an opinion that a skateboard pushed up a hill will eventually come to rest and then return back down the hill. And, it, and such an opinion couldn't be described as irrational, even though the expert makes no reference to gravity or friction or any, uh, in any attempt to explain why, why he, or, he or she expresses that opinion. But uh, in his usual way, Justice Leeming came up with a better example than that. In, in his judgment, he said, competent professional practice uh, to administer lime juice to treat and to ward off scurvy, among, scurvy amongst sailors, preceded by many decades any understanding of the role of vitamins in human health. The fact that the reasons given in the late 18th and 19th centuries for the practice were wrong or non-existent did not make the practice irrational. It was known to work. And that's just, that's just a, a glorious example, I think, <laughs> with respect. <laughs> um, and this is an interesting point because I must say I came into um, this matter, the Gould matter, at the appeal stage and I was a, uh, a bit nervous on, on the appeal that the evidence that we had on 5A, which had been rejected by the trial judge, was um, pretty pithy. Like Dr Harsh's report, I think, was two pages and it was couldn't... Uh, wasn't exactly heavily attended by reasoning, but uh, he effectively said all the right things. He used the magic words in the section and um, said that he thought that what was done here by way of um, the uh, antibiotic administration accorded with competent professional practice, etc. And um, Justice Leeming said this about that evidence. It's true that in many respects Dr Harsh did not articulate the reasoning process leading to the conclusions tersely expressed in his two-page letter. But it does not follow those conclusions were irrational, it merely follows that it would have been open to the plaintiff to object to its tender. And I think this makes the point that I tried to make earlier, that it, there may be all sorts of problems that attend a failure to give reasons, including um, objection under Makita and Daz Reef principles. The, the, the evidence might not get in, but it's not a basis on which to find the opinion irrational. Um, I probably can leap over this. The, 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 there, there was a, a time when there was debate in the authorities about whether it was necessary to plead Section 5A. I think um, we can all accept that the weight of the authority now is that you must plead it. Um, and there's, in the paper I've extracted these passages, but for the present purposes, let's uh, proceed on the basis you must plead it. Now, and I think there's a great advantage in properly trying to plead out the section because it does, from a defendant's perspective, focus um, minds on how you're going to make good uh, the section. And it does, for example, if one, uh, and we'll come to what Justice Garling has said about the bare minimum required for pleading the section, but it does 
um, assist in preparing the evidence. If if one has pleaded out what one says is the practice, try try to f- settle on a form of words in the defence that identifies what the practice is. So, for example, in the Gould decision, um, the, the the relevant practice was to administer in respect of um, children having this particular or patients presenting with this particular um, fracture. Um, this regime of antibiotics or to meet the plaintiff's case um, the practice was to not administer gentamicin. Um, Justice Garling, this is uh, an extract from a um, a, a, a speech that Justice Garling gave to a CPD conference um, rather than extracted from a judgment but it's quite helpful um, in, in that it makes the point that merely restating the words of the section is inadequate. You must try um, to identify the manner of practice and articulate um, what it what it was, what it is that you say comprises the practice, and what you say your um, the, the defendant did on this occasion. Um, I think I'll skip this. There's a section in the paper dealing with um, section five O as it applies in um, to, to construction cases, particularly um, uh, to build cases involving building professionals, engineers and the like. Um, but just make this one point, there, there's a reference to a decision of Justice McDougall in what's known as the Lane Cove Tunnel case, um, in which His Honour was considering a Section 5A defence that had been raised by the defendant engineers in that case, and His Honour made the point that when consider- relevant to the question of whether the engineer's conduct complied with um, what was regarded as peer professional opinion, uh, or what was regarded by peer professional opinion as competent professional practice, relevant to that inquiry was to know what was the context in which the engineer was even involved in the project. And so the starting point to know the context was to look at the contract. What, what was the actual scope of works that defined the engineer's retainer? So for example, in the Lane Cove Tunnel case, there was an issue about whether the design engineers had a role during construction to supervise the uh, installation of uh, tunnel support. And to get to the bottom of that question, because it was said that um, against the engineers that they had negligently failed to um, pick up departures from design that were being perpetrated by the builders of the tunnel. And so the starting point for an inquiry about what competent professional practice dictated in that very context had to be, well, did the engineer indeed have an obligation under the contract to inspect? And if so, what was the inspection regime that was required of it? Seems pretty logical when one thinks about it, but um, it perhaps makes the point that the Section 5A defence extends beyond uh, um, medical negligence cases and has has work to do in any form of professional negligence proceeding. Um, This is another uh, to- a topic worthy of a CPD in itself, but it, one of the burning issues, is, as people know, here will no doubt be aware, is that in an earlier decision of McKenna, um, Justice McFarlane um, held in rejecting a Section 5.0 defence that effectively um, uh, the, the to, to, en- get, to engage the defence, the the the, the, the the defendant has to demonstrate that what was done. Um, was done pursuant to a practice. Um, and so, for example, in McKenna, where the issue was um, whether the hospital was negligent in its decision to discharge a psychiatric patient who went on to, um, uh, within a half an hour of discharge, to kill his friend uh, who was driving him home, um, Justice McFarlane rejected the Section 5 defence, which had been upheld by the trial judge, on the basis that... Um, the decision to discharge was something that was so patient specific, so unique to the particular circumstances of that day, that you could not be said that the, the discharge decision was one that was uh, carried out pursuant to a practice, and therefore his honour held that um, the Section 5A defence was not available to the defendant in that case. Now, um, r- regrettably, um, the, Justice Bre- Beasley, the President, agreed with. Uh, Justice McFarlane about that. There was a strong dissent by um, uh, Justice Garling. The matter went to the High Court, but um, and one of the appeal points we took was the um, this question of the practice, uh, the practice finding by Justice Mc, uh, McFarlane. 
but the High Court upheld the appeal on the duty point and found it unnecessary to deal with the numerous other appeal grounds that we had raised in McKenna. So that left unsettled um, this question whether Justice McFarlane's call for a practice was um, was uh, necessary, uh, was correct, was good law. When Sparks and Hobson uh, was argued, the same issue came up, um, and Justice McFarlane uh, sat on that case as well and, and, and held that um, what he'd said in McKenna about the practice point um, was right and he'd follow it again. Um, Justice uh, Baston said of it that he thought it was wrong and he would not follow it and, more, and moreover said that it was not binding and he didn't regard himself as having to follow it. And Justice Simpson said that she thought it was wrong and she wouldn't follow it, but she thought she was bound by what had been said in McKenna, so she she did apply it in uh, in Sparks. So it was just this: we're left with this still unsettled question whether what McFarlane's Justice McFarlane said about the practice in McKenna and repeated about the practice in Sparks remains good law. So I say that for until it is settled, uh, it's prudent to plead something in defences to this effect that I've put up on the screen. It's in the um, it's in the uh, paper, but. I think it's necessary for a defendant to say, look, if it, if it, if which is denied, the practice point raised in McKenna is good law, then um, we say that what we did was pursuant to a practice, and here's all the reasons why we say it was pursuant to a practice. And there was high hopes that in the special leave application in Sparks that um, that this that there was special leave would be granted, and um, and that this whole issue might be sorted out by the High Court, but regrettably. Special leave was not given. Uh, one thing about proving the section is that the Sparks decision itself demonstrates how difficult it is because it, it, on the one hand, Justice uh, Baston said of the evidence, the Section 50 evidence that the defendant adduced in Sparks and Hobson, which was not challenged at all, uh, that in his view it didn't come up to the mark, it didn't establish to a level that should have satisfied the court, that um, what the defendant did accorded with the competent professional practice, etc. That was Justice McBaston's view. Justice Simpson, who considered the same evidence, said the opposite. In her view, um, the evidence did satisfy Section 50, and she would have upheld the defence, except she felt bound to follow what McFarlane, Justice McFarlane had said in McKenna uh, and, f and find that there was no practice in being pursued. But on the question whether there was a sufficiency of evidence to make good the Section 5 over defence, just ignoring the practice point for the moment, you've got two Court of Appeal judges taking a different view about the same suite of evidence, which might demonstrate how difficult it is. But I, I think, um, it's not very sophisticated, but I think that the, the best advice you can have is to, that you know, more, some evidence is good and more is better. If, you can get, if you're a defendant trying to prove a 5 over defence, the more medicos you can call, be they treating medicos or medico legal experts, to um, adhere to or to, to swear to the uh, to the ubiquitous ubiquitous nature of the practice and the fact that it reflects competent professional practice, widely held, etc. Um, the more ex evidence you can adduce on that point, the better your chances of satisfying a court about it. Um, Justice Baston said uh, something about how much proof is needed in, in, uh, in Sparks. There will be a question as to whether the evidence of one or two experts can satisfactorily establish opinions which are widely accepted. Um, and I must say, it always uh, troubles me whenever one's trying to run a 5 defence, the question is whether you've got enough. And so often you're, you're left with one or two doctors at most, or one or two experts, <laughs> to, to swear to the ubiquitous nature of the practice and, and its wide acceptance, etc. And I often think that, um, with respect, many plaintiff counsel don't do a good enough job of getting stuck into experts just uh, as to who, who opine to that effect uh, just just on the on the factual question of what they actually know about what happens throughout Australia because the section speaks of what uh, is is held uh, what widely is what is widely regarded throughout Australia and m most medicos will at best be able to tell you what happens in their own hometown but I'm pretty sure that a lot wouldn't be able to, to say what happens in Perth or in Adelaide <laughs> and so if I was uh, for a plaintiff trying to uh, undermine 5 evidence, I think I'd focus a lot of the guns on trying to uh, establish that the defendant spruiking this material hasn't really got any um, decent knowledge of what happens around the country. 
I mean, I think for a defendant, the, the more um, you can have your experts who are uh, expressing the 5 evidence, the more they can bolster it by uh, reference to their uh, knowledge of, of of the collegiate practice. You know, what 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 papers have they read? What uh, committees did they sit upon? What standards uh, uh, have they contributed to the to the um, writing of? What policies, etc. What, what what national and international conferences they've attended? All of that material has to be. Um, uh, pleaded out, if you like, in the in the in the evidence to to, to uh, at least have some chance of meeting uh, an attack that most good plaintiff counsel should should bring. Um, there's more said by Justice Baston in Sparks on the, on this point. Um, I, I won't labour it. It's um, in the all in the paper. Um, J Justice Garling had something to say about the same topic, though. Um, he gave this example, if the negligent conduct is said to have been constituted by an omission, commonly in the medical sphere, an omission to undertake an identified test, uh, the defendant may need to prove what the context for the consultation was, what opinion the defendant formed, perhaps the differential diagnosis which was reached, and that the test which is alleged ought to have been carried out was unnecessary or inappropriate or too risky, as the case may be. Um, and that's really a reference to um, a call for evidence from the actual treater, the, the defendant whose conduct's been impugned. Um, I think I'll move over these points, they're covered in the paper. Um, one final point on this though, Justice Bastin in Sparks th did make this point that a bald statement by a practitioner, however well qualified, without reference to the specific factors giving rise to a claim of negligence may well not persuade the court that there's a relevant standard identified in the evidence. And often um, you do see the 5-0 topic. It's, it's often the last question asked in the letter of instruction to um, to the experts, and it's whether it's as a matter of exhaustion or <laughs> lack of interest at the end of their reports, they address that last question usually um, in pretty sparse terms by simply saying that, in, you know, in my opinion, the defendant acted in a manner that, etc. And often it's not clear when the expert expresses that opinion that what it, what it is that he or she understands to have been the manner in which the defendant acted. So at a bare minimum, the, the, the witness, the expert has to be asked to assume that the defendant acted in the following manner or did the following things before one can ask him, him, him or her to legitimately express an opinion about how it sits with Australia-wide practice. That was all I planned to say. Thank you. Questions? Got a, a medical negligence claim and the defendant hasn't pleaded Section 5 then what kind of standard of care are you looking at? What, what sort of, what, sorry? When they haven't pleaded Section 5 Yes. Uh, so what's the standard of care in that case? It's the 5B, 5C. Uh, it's, it's what typically what the plaintiff establishes first through, the, through its evidence in chief, through its experts, yeah. is the relevant standard, yeah. I mean, one point that Serge and I were discussing earlier today is that often when it's time to file a defence, and often, almost always, you don't have the expert evidence to support the 5A defence, so acting ethically, you can't plead it. You have to simply plead, fight the battle on a 5B, 5C basis and amend when you've got the 5A evidence. Now, I can't imagine a situation where a trial judge in that circumstance would deprive a defendant of a right to amend to rely upon the 5A defence once it's explained that, Your Honour, we didn't have the material before and now we do. But I, I think that's how it... I mean, it, it sort of points to some inefficiencies in the conduct of cases because it does put the plaintiff in the terrible position of having put their evidence in chief on that doesn't speak of 5A. Um, having to then revisit the topic in reply uh, to the defendant's evidence. But that's indeed what is said in Dobler will be the, the way it'll play in practice. The, the, the plaintiff will run its case ignoring 5-0. It'll put the 5-B, 5-C evidence on. Uh, the defendant might raise 5-0 in defence. If it does, then it's over to the plaintiff to meet it with evidence in reply to the, to the defendants. Luce. Oh, sorry. <laughs> As you know, medicine is often in flux and it's transitioning from one practice 
in Justice McFarlane's idea, to a new practice which is considered superior for various reasons. And you can sort of get caught in the middle sometimes with saying, at what, what sort of evidence do you need to say at what point in time should everyone have shifted to the new practice? Would you, who would you call to? <laughs> Someone else. <laughs> I mean, I, often I think the um, the best witnesses on these uh, topics are the presidents of the colleges, the, the, the because they, they seem to be the ones that have the most handle across what uh, the, the various um, subcommittees and in, within the um, colleges, uh, what, what, what the research is and what the latest practices are. I think that you. I mean, I don't know whether it's a matter for academics to to come along and say what. When it was that a practice shifted. How important do you think protocols are? For example, uh, in the case I'm involved in, there is a standard protocol for the administration of a particular drug and the circumstances. And from what I can gather, it's pretty universal amongst every hospital, not just in Australia, everywhere. Um, is it worthwhile tendering? Each protocol from you know nine hospitals in New South Wales, ten hospitals in Victoria, or is that just overkill? No, I, I think it's it is necessary, but you do have the advantage of I think whatever is it, section fifty of the Evidence Act that allows you to summarise the, the yeah. content of a large number of documents. So, so but, but often it will be um, something that can be agreed with the other side. It is necessary to, to produce the material to them to show that these protocols exist in. The same form across various disciplines or jurisdictions, but I do think the protocols are often they're the best uh, evidence of what the practice is. The difficulty is then if you have to call your treater, any slight departure from the protocol yeah. is uh, is a pretty uncomfortable time. While he or she gets cut cut to ribbons about that. Mm. Close. Um, I have a question about um, pleading five O. I've had it suggested that. Would it potentially plead it um, not just as defence, but in relation to scope of duty? So the defendant says the scope of duty is to be determined by and then plead yeah. um, the wording of 5.0. Do you think there's any merit in I, I, I do, and this is one of the things that Richard and I were discussing earlier today. One, you can't do it obviously enough in the first iteration of the defence because you don't have the material, but upon getting it, when, when you go to amend, I think it, it is appropriate to plead at the front of the defence that um, in respect of um, duty and breach, that the, that the standard of care is dict dictated by the 5.0 evidence and, and, and then particularise the evidence that, that the practice is identified in the 5.0 evidence. And I think so, yeah. Because the, the thrust of what Justice Leeming says in Gould about 5.0, and I think it also comes out of Dobler, is that um, if you've got a 5.0, 5.0 evidence that is accepted, because it sets a standard, it becomes the very first issue that the court should consider because you can eschew all the 5B and 5C inquiries. And, yeah. Tim. Yeah, that, that's why leave was, special leave was was not given in Hobson. Yeah, that was very fact heavy. as well in coordination and five hours. And and indeed, the the, the appellant, the applicant for leave was um, disadvantaged by the fact that the trial judge in Sparks did not um, deal with the five O defence properly at all. In fact, his honour was um, Justice Harrison in in Sparks, the trial judge, observed that the defendants. 5.0 evidence in that case was not touched by the plaintiff's evidence, was not touched in cross-examination, was not touched in submissions. So it was completely unchallenged. So uh, at that point in the judgment, the defendant would be thinking uh, the 5.0 defence was looking pretty solid. But his honour in a single sentence said that, but nevertheless, for the reasons I've earlier given about breach, uh, I find, I reject the 5.0 defence, which was, which the Court of Appeal readily agreed was an erroneous approach because it was obvious enough from that that his honour had embarked on the 5B, 5C inquiry before he'd even considered the import of the 5O evidence, which was wrong. 
you should start with the five O evidence. If you yeah. if you accept it, there's the standard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, it's a tragic, tragic on, case. On um, irrationality, I think Lemo seems to discount, well, he goes through given the cases in, in England earlier, um, the Litho and Hudson Coal, and whatever, but mm. we seem to know what it isn't, we know it's rare. There's no definition of irrationality. No definition com- of irrationality in- seems to be flux. True. Google, Google doesn't give you any assistance on what. Yeah. <laughs> I've always thought of it, even though it's not sort of said anywhere, that those cases do give a bit of context in the guide. Uh, Hudson Collar probably in particular, and the way I sort of did shortcutting, uh, sort of think about it is the, the risk benefit analysis. And one thing I've learned from the conferencing with uh, specialists, but from any doctor, you sort of first thing you can gauge them with. I think so. I mean, well, in uh, Hux and Cole, um, it was interesting. In the argument in Gould, um, we handed up an extract from um, D- Dominic Villa's book, I think, um, on the, uh, uh, in the context of dealing with the um, the rooting speech and um, in, in uh, the Civil Liability Act bill, and um, and the judges were puzzled. The, the Court of Appeal judges, all three of them, were puzzled as to why. We, we handed up a copy of Hux and Cole as well, and they were worried. They were puzzled as to why Hux and Cole had anything uh, to do with the five O irrationality in, inquiry, and they were somewhat critical of, um, or they were, they were querying why um, Dominic Dominic's book referred to it. But the IP, the IP committee, in uh, putting forward the five O recommendation, expressly referred to Hux and Cole as an example of. Um, of where uh, there might be an irrational and irrational practice, I think in Hux and Kyle it was a similar case to Gould in that the, I think um, there was a failure to administer a particular antibiotic to a to a, um, a child who was was clearly um, septic and um, and you know the, that was found to be a um, a, a gross uh, breach of duty I think on the part of the medico but. Um, uh, there were, he, the Medico adduced evidence in that case in England uh, to say that a lot of doctors in that situation would not have administered this particular antibiotic and the Court of Appeals have said that was irrational given the, the efficacy of the drug and that there were no nothing contraindicating giving it. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> Only the way to look at it, Tim, is to think of Lee's example of the scurvy. You know, corollary of it. So in other words, instead of giving people antibiotics and giving them the lime juice, Even though the respondent on the application for leave said yes, there's an issue, they said this wasn't the right vehicle. Yeah. I mean that was what was so disappointing about it. And it was quite clever from the response point of view, so to admit at the start, look, this is this is an issue that needs to be solved. No one knows what the answer is, as Richard outlined as to practice. Um, but this isn't the right vehicle. And Justice Gordon, they were off the bench for 20 minutes and Justice Gordon Talked, I think Justice Fairlingwood. So it wasn't a quick decision, but it was an unfortunate one from a practitioner's point of view because he's still left in the situation. Yeah. Andrew? Uh, I'm just wondering whether there are some cases that, that you think actually it's just not really worth running a 5 0 defence. Um, because it, as with the case of Gould, where you've got a defined 
um, uh, approach to treatment. So it is a defined practice yes. in a fairly concrete sense. But in, say, the Sparks case, you've got the practice is essentially a clinical judgment being made from moment to moment yes. uh, throughout a course of treatment. Um, and while you might think that a clinical judgment um, might be capable of being defined as a as a as as competent professional practice, um, the the sheer burden of proving that each moment, um, as the circumstances change, that that decision is 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 reaffirmed uh, throughout the course of treatment. That, that that's a that's a particularly heavy burden to put upon a defendant um, uh, ahead of ahead of a, a trial yeah. to provide evidence for that. There's no doubt that once you make the decision to plead it, it's a heavy evidentiary burden for the defendant, a lot of work, yeah. I mean, remembering though that the section speaks not, contrary to Justice McFarlane's position in McKenna, <laughs> the, the section speaks of uh, act, uh, how the professional acted, that is, act, did the professional act in a manner. It doesn't speak, it doesn't require one to demonstrate that, um, in my humble submission, it doesn't require the defendant to demonstrate that what was done was done pursuant to a practice. It was all we one focuses on is did the defendant, did the medico, did the professional act in a manner that would be widely regarded by his peers as competent professional practice. It doesn't matter whether those peers have ever been in that very situation themselves. They, they simply need to look at what the medico said or did and said, look, I would have acted in the same manner or I regard that as competent professional practice. But if, but if, but if you take the factual sort of scenario part of the, the equation, so you've got the facts and then you've got the opinion, and if the facts are subtly changing during the course of, of, of surgery as, as it did, mm. um, that you might have at sort of um, 19, 30 hours, mm. that the pr pr metabolic parameters are of a certain form and then you've got your blood pressure and your oxygen and after a telephone call is made, the, um, the, the metabolic parameters have perhaps changed slightly. Well. The, it's, it's then thought that the opinion that was taken at this point in time and was reasoned and stated might not apply mm. um, 20 minutes later when perhaps things had subtly changed. Um, th that's, that's defining um, the, the, the practice in the sense of a, of a clinical judgment down to a very precise um, factual circumstances. Yeah. Um, I, I, suppose, I suppose that's the uniqueness of that particular clinical situation, uh, whether that's really a, a credible um, thing that can that can be run, in, in your view, in a in a trial. Well, uh, it does highlight, I think, because as we all know, the, the evidence of what in fact occurred often comes out differently to what uh, to, to the way in which the assumptions had been prepared before trial. And cross examination usually exposes some departure from what. Uh, what the assumptions were. It is necessary, I think, to conference um, the 5 hour experts before you call them um, to, to appraise them of how the evidence has come out uh, and, di and, and has come out differently from the assumptions that, that they were asked and have them adhere to what they've said if they will, if, they're, if it's um, their honest opinion, that uh, ha have them adhere to the proposition that even in this new, new, newly assumed set of facts, the conduct uh, was competent. I, I think. So it doesn't have to be. The expert doesn't have to say that's what I would have done. No. It's it's a judgment of the practice within a larger. This is why Justice McFarlane is not correct. It's in within the larger sphere of competent professional practice. Even if your expert says under cross examination. I would not have done that. Mm. That doesn't take it out of the prior defence, does it? No, that's true. Indeed, in, in the McKenna case itself, I, I did the trial, all, all, all stages of the McKenna matter, and in the trial, um, there were six medico-legal psychiatrists in a joint getting, giving evidence concurrently, and um, on, on the critical question of um, whether the decision to discharge this particular psychiatric patient, when he'd only been admitted uh, about 36 hours earlier, he'd only been sort of medicated down for 36 hours, he was still arguably... Um, psychotic, uh, he was discharged into the care of his friend who was going to drive him home um, to uh, Victoria, a, a long drive, 10 or 12 hours, and uh, and they only got half an hour down the road before the patient strangled the friend and then later uh, hanged himself in jail, the patient. So it was a tragic case all around. But in the McKenna evidence, there were the three plaintiff psychiatrists included 
um, Dr. Phillips, and critically in the concurrent evidence session, he, he accepted, he admitted or conceded, if that's the right term, that he would, um, whilst he personally would not have discharged the patient, he would concede that a lot of his colleagues would. And that was a critical piece of evidence that turned the trial judge. The judge upheld the 5A defence on, really on, largely on that basis. Um, it's a little bit different because when they come to discharge a psychiatric patient, you're looking at definitions in the Mental Health Act. It's not just a clinical no. judgment of, yes, they're psychotic, you can, whatever, you can take them as read, they are. You've then got to move to there's a risk of harm to themselves or other, and you've got to evaluate that risk, and then you've got to work out well whether they could be safely discharged into the care as they did in, mm. in this case. So it goes beyond um, medical practice. Yeah, and indeed, it, it really is a legal question, and and so I can see why that issue wouldn't fall within uh, the Section Five O uh, defence. Although it's still possible to say that a decision to discharge, albeit one constrained by the Mental Health Act and the concerns about the, the least restrictive care, etc., um, I, th I think it's still possible to say that um, the, f that the f section does a does apply to, to such decisions be because, albeit decisions are taken with with one eye to the Act. <laughs> mm. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Any further questions? <laughs> yeah, good idea. That's why that's why he's running the show. <laughs>